I should give up and simply turn you over to one of the world's leading experts on regulation, uh, who, while uh, uh, he does not bring a background in doing experimental uh, criminology to this lecture, uh, it will soon be clear why he is such uh, a superb choice and why we are honored to have him uh, deliver this lecture, which was established by the Swedish National Council on Crime Prevention in honor of the original donor to the Stockholm Prize, uh, Jerry Lee, and the Jerry Lee Foundation uh, provided the, uh, the prize amount for the first years of the prize, allowing it to uh, demonstrate a proof of con concept, not with a randomized control trial, uh, but with uh, what uh, might be called a phase one trial. Uh, in medicine where you give people the drug to see if they drop dead, and in fact, uh, in this case, it didn't uh, lead to any death of the prize. In fact, quite the opposite. It attracted the support, magnificent support of the Soderbergh Foundations and matching money from the Ministry of Justice uh, here in Sweden so that it's now permanently endowed. And all of that started with Jerry Lee being willing to step up to the plate and um, get this experiment started. And in recognition of his particular interest in experimental criminology, uh, the annual Jerry Lee Lecture uh, at the uh, Stockholm Criminology Symposium, which is the only session held in plenary with no other sessions uh, besides the, uh, the opening session with the minister and the, the prize winner's address. Um, so we have a, a, a great opportunity to reflect on Jerry Lee's interest in experimental criminology, not just to hear about its latest achievements, uh, but also, I think, just as important to think uh, critically and thoughtfully uh, about the role that experimental criminology can play as part of a broader growth of knowledge and enlightenment uh, about uh, crime policy uh, in general, and this year about uh, policing and problem solving uh, in particular. Um, Professor Malcolm Sparrow, who's a professor uh, of, of the practice of, of public management at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, uh, has um, a unique uh, background for uh, discussing uh, these issues. Uh, from the standpoint of experimental analysis, uh, he uh, is a uh, mathematics graduate of um, uh, my current employer, the University of Cambridge. Uh, he also holds a doctorate in that field uh, and combines that, uh, I think, perhaps uniquely, uh, with service in the British police uh, in Kent's Constabulary, which is an outstanding organization we're currently uh, doing a, a lot of um, highly quantitative things with. Uh, and he served there uh, up to the rank of Detective Chief Inspector in, in a variety of uh, jobs, uh, including uh, the fraud squad, uh, firearms, uh, internal affairs, and um, other general police operations. So he, he understands what uh, Herman Goldstein has been uh, addressing for uh, his 60 years uh, in thinking about uh, policing. And uh, you can uh, certainly get a sense of that in uh, Malcolm Sparrow's book uh, with Mark Moore and David Kennedy uh, called Beyond 911. Beyond 911, which is the, the three-digit emergency number for the police in the United States, uh, comparable to uh, 999 in Britain, and I, I'm ashamed to say I don't know what the number is in Sweden. Anybody here know the emergency number in Sweden? 112. Thank you, Yurti. Um, well, uh, I don't expect we'll have an emergency this morning, but um, uh, if we do, it will be informed by uh, the kinds of police reforms that uh, Malcolm Sparrow has addressed in his most recent book on policing, uh, which is called Handcuffed, uh, What Holds Policing Back and the Keys to Reform, um, in which uh, he builds on his earlier work, uh, including The Character of Harms, um, a book on health care fraud called License to Steal, um, a, a broader um, discussion of regulation and how to get people to comply with things called the regulatory craft, um, and another book on regulation called Imposing uh, Duties. Uh, his most recent book, Handcuffed, has uh, a, a very clear and forthright critique of um, evidence-based policing uh, and uh, some of those who are uh, uh, doing it, teaching it, and uh, promoting it. 
Um, and uh, my, my colleagues uh, in, in that enterprise uh, were uh, in uh, great uh, agreement uh, about the benefit of having uh, a word uh, or more from Professor Sparrow at this session in the context in particular of experimental criminology, um, which is not all that um, evidence-based policing is about, but certainly uh, experiments uh, are a major part of our concept of evidence-based policing. And so um, knowing that police from all over the world uh, are also uh, studying with uh, Professor Sparrow, uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderful time for us to reflect on how these issues come together around Herman Goldstein's magnificent contribution uh, with the framework for problem-oriented policing. With no further ado, please welcome Professor Malcolm K. Sparrow. Thank you, Larry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Larry. It's an honor for me to be here today, um, particularly to be asked to give the Jerry Lee Lecture. Um, it's a unique opportunity. It's a privilege for me to be here as part of Herman Goldstein's celebration. Uh, one thing that Larry didn't mention to you is that um, when he originally offered the invitation to me to come and deliver this lecture, um, I thought about it long and hard and then eventually declined. Um, and the reason was I'm not a criminologist and I've never before been to a criminology conference. That's not what I normally do or how I spend my time. I felt unqualified um, and probably that I didn't fit. Uh, but he hadn't told me who was the prize recipient um, because he wasn't allowed to at that point. Uh, he just told me, that well, it's somebody whose work is sort of closely associated with yours. Um, that wasn't really enough for me to understand uh, quite what the fit would be. Um, and then when the announcement came out later that it was Herman Goldstein, who I've known since 1985, and uh, whose work I love dearly, a uh, man I love dearly, um, I contacted Larry and said, I assume you've already filled this spot, but if it's by chance still open uh, for Herman, I would come. Um, I would love to be there to share in this uh, celebration. He hadn't filled the post, he let me come back in. I'm very grateful to you for your flexibility, your graciousness um, in letting me do this and then that. Um, I'm going to tell you a couple reasons why uh, I feel I don't fit in this uh, setting, um, but I'm going to try and turn those things into positives in terms of the perspective I'm going to uh, lay out for you. Um, first of all, I'm not a habitual user of the preferred tools of uh, social science or of criminology, I have a confession to make to you. In 30 years of academic life, I have never once conducted a randomized controlled trial myself. I have never done a regression analysis, even though I have taught students how to do them. Um, I've never participated in a Campbell collaboration study. Um, and I guess I should pause, pause at that moment, and several of you may leave because you have concluded I am an academic uh, slouch. Um, analytically incompetent. Uh, well, hold on a minute. Um, I am a mathematician by training, a double first from Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, I did my PhD in nine months in applied mathematics, um, particularly focusing on pattern recognition. I invented the topological approach to fingerprint matching, um, which not only earned me a PhD, but six patents. Um, so, I think I'm analytical, but I'm not at all immersed in the habits uh, or the norms um, or the preferred tools of any particular discipline, neither social science, criminology, nor any other specific discipline. I write fraud detection algorithms for fun uh, because I enjoy it. The second thing that makes me maybe weird or feels out of place is that at the, at the moment, my focus on the police profession is probably about 5% of my time. Uh, not 100%. Um, I went to the Kennedy School from the police, and obviously I was going to be focusing on uh, police strategy and development, and um, I soon discovered as an academic that the police profession doesn't actually move terribly fast, um, and that it takes any serious idea about 10 years to be incorporated, and they already had two, uh, problem-oriented policing and community policing, and they hadn't finished with those, 
And in fact, I believe they still haven't. Um, and so, um, because I was used to being busy and my phone wasn't ringing, um, I just took other odd, strange and oppor opportunities. I started working with the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington on the intelligent use of environmental data. Um, I did a project with the IRS. Uh, they had an initiative called Compliance Management. The, fa the fact that that's an initiative might be a surprise to you. Uh, but what it meant was a problem-solving approach to identifying patterns of non-compliance and then addressing them intelligently. Um, and uh, as I worked with these two other professions, <coughs> I was lying in the bath one day, which is or it's either there or in a plane looking down on the clouds where you get a moment to reflect, and I'm thinking all of a sudden I'm seeing in these other two professions precisely the same set of aspirations and obstacles and uh, organizational dilemmas that the police are wrestling with. So I wrote the first book just describing those three professions, environment, tax, and police, and saying, hold on a minute, there's an awful lot of parallels here. Um, I wonder how many others are going through the same kind of transitions. And as soon as that book came out, I heard from New, Ze New Zealand Fisheries Commission within a month. I heard from the Occupational Safety and Health Agency. I heard from the US Customs Service. And they said, me too, me too, me too. This is precisely what we're all uh, dealing with. And so by the year 2000, they um, you know, admitted that it, the field was much broader. I wrote the, the book, The Regulatory Craft, um, about managing compliance and solving problems uh, and controlling risks. Um, and uh, it began to be obvious that this was, uh, there was a set of truths across a broad range of social regulators um, absolutely articulated clearly in, in Hermann Goldstein's work, not articulated so clearly in almost any of these other professions, but nevertheless wrestling with the same things. Um, anyway, you've made me feel, feel welcome um, in a number of ways. I'm happy now that I fit. Um, first of all, criminologists turn out to be hospitable and warm, decent human beings. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but thank you uh, for that. Uh, second, Michael Scott, uh, through this conference, has run in this room this most extraordinary series. Um, huge amount of work for him, but bringing forward endless uh, project after project after project, actually illustrating the way that scholars and practitioners work together, often jointly presented. Um, and that's been a rich and uh, very familiar experience uh, from my point of view. I don't know whether that always happens at this conference. Um, or whether that's in Herman's honor also. Um, but the fact that the method is celebrated in that way is delightful from my point of view. Um, and the third way that I fit is that I feel, looking back, uh, much of my 30 years' work uh, has been to take Herman Goldstein's very clear articulation of the problem-solving approach way beyond the confines of the police profession. And I'm going to talk uh, today from the perspective of um, a rather broad range of uh, uh, application areas. Um, I mentioned US Customs. Uh, Herman's not with us this morning, but uh, I will tell you a strange story. Um, working with the Customs, they were about to implement a problem-solving approach to narcotics interdiction on the southern border. It was a special project to be run in the third of the organization that consists of enforcement agents. Um, at the peak of this uh, initiative, they had up to uh, 165 separate projects all running on different patterns of narcotic smuggling and methods. But before they launched it, um, the person in charge was a little bit nervous and said, so, Professor, well, I wasn't a professor then, I was something lowlier, um, a lecturer. He said, is this just you? Um, are, we, are we really going to make this investment based on your idea? And I said, this isn't my idea at all. Um, this is happening all over the regulatory frontier. Um, if you want to meet somebody else who's really laid it out, meet Herman Goldstein. So they invited, and they said, we'd like to meet Herman Goldstein. I gave him the, them his number. They called him up. He said he would come. He flew into Dallas Airport. They gave him a law enforcement welcome, which they thought was funny. Uh, they introduced a packet of marijuana into his suitcase. Um, before it came out on the baggage carousel. Um, and once he'd picked it up off the 
baggage carousel, he was then intercepted by a drug-sniffing dog that repeatedly sat down at his feet, which of course is the signal. And then somebody approaches and opens a bag and there's a big packet of marijuana. I'm glad Herman is still with us. <laughs> I asked him yesterday if he remembered this and how he felt about it, and he said, I was amused. <laughs> Remarkable man. How broad might uh, the application of these ideas be? Some people, you, you, you've heard the advice, no more than 15 words on a PowerPoint slide. Uh, how's this for non-compliance? Uh, this is the very first paragraph of uh, my book, The Character of Harms, but what I'm doing is quoting the Millennium Declaration of the United Nations. So this is when the human race gets together and figures out what is the unfinished work for the next century. And what they did is produce a list of harms not sufficiently controlled around the world. Hunger, war, genocide, weapons of mass destruction, international terrorism, the world drug problem, transnational crime, smuggling of human beings, etc. If you can't read it, you shouldn't be driving a car. Um, an enormous list, and what I see when I read this, is problems to be solved. In fact, not problems. Each of these is not a problem. It's a huge class of problems. <clears throat> and they chose to express this as a bads to be controlled. And all of these fields are in the same business, the identification and control of risks or harms of various kinds. <clears throat> Do we have a language? Um, that says, uh, what is the discipline that, that lies behind this? What is the professional set of skills that all of these uh, areas would share? I'm not sure that we do. Um, if I'm far enough away from Harvard and people ask me what I do, I say, well, my subject is the control of bad things. It doesn't sound academic enough to say that at Harvard. We have to call it operational risk management or harm reduction. Um, but a lot of those phrases have been spoilt by particular usage in different fields. The control of bad things is really it. Um, and when I told my dean one day that that's what I was doing, he said, well, at least that's uncontroversial. <laughs> and he said, by the way, isn't that the same as doing good? Uh, and I said, no, it's not. It's quite different, it has quite different analytic requirements. It's a wholly different focus and you can promote goods um, or you can control bads and they're quite different operations and you need a balance to be struck and relationships between them. This is part of the basic design conundrum if you're in a risk management business. And of course, even though they didn't list them, you can also talk about violence and crime and pollution and fraud and occupational hazards. And many of these are areas for government regulation and many of them are thickly populated by philanthropy and not-for-profit organizations that take a piece of one of these global problems and contribute what they can. I'm going to talk a little bit towards the end of my talk about specific uh, issues in organizing philanthropy. Um, so there it is, that's the first... Uh, there's the cover of the book. Um, it's got this strange knot on the front, um, which I'd like you to look at a bit more carefully. <clears throat> I really like this picture. In fact, I'm proud of it because I took it myself. I designed the cover. Um, I wanted a really good looking knot to go on the front cover and the editor at Cambridge University Press said, uh, well, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, we have very extensive digital archives. Why don't you just check them? And I did. They had over 500 pictures of knots. I didn't like any of them. Um, so I said to him, I, you know, I can do better than that myself. And uh, he said, I'd really rather you didn't. You should just write the book. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, the older I get, the more of a morning person I become. And by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I can't write anymore. Um, and by the way, then the light is better for, for photography. So I'll do this in the late afternoon as a reward for a day's writing. I took over 400 pictures of knots. They, they said in the end they really like this one because it doesn't have a rope coming out of one side. <clears throat> Why is that significant? Because if you rotate it clockwise 90 degrees, there's space for the title. They said that made their digital life a lot easier. Um, in fact, I didn't just take the picture. I went to the Marine Surplus Supply Store in Meredith, New Hampshire. I have a lake house on Lake Winnipesaukee, uh, which is in the middle of New Hampshire, two hours north of Boston. That's where I go to think and rest. 
and kayak. Um, and New Hampshire is full of hunters and fishermen and marine boaters and some tourists, skiers too in the wintertime. Um, the marine surplus supply store is a strange environment. It's a long grassy field with a big rusty uh, warehouse um, and it's all full of men. There's not a woman in sight. Um, and they're all rummaging through buckets looking for the part that they need to mend their engine or somebody else's marine engine. And in this environment, I go to the man who works there. His name is George, and I said, I, I need some really good-looking old-fashioned ropes, something with color and texture. Um, and he looked at me very suspiciously. I said, what for? Um, and why don't you buy modern polyester ones? Because they come in much longer lengths, and they're much cheaper per foot, and um, they don't rot when they're wet, and uh, they float. These would sink when they're wet. And I said, no, no, you don't, don't understand. I need to tie knots and take pictures of them and put them on the front cover of my book. And now he looked at me like I came from some other planet. Um, but he threw together a pile of ropes, including these two, and uh, sold them to me for, he said, $5. I gave him 10. They were so lovely. Um, and six months later, I came back and brought him a copy of my book. And he didn't even remember me. So that was a very humiliating day, and uh, I have not shown my face in there ever since. Uh, but what's the point? <clears throat> uh, even while I'm telling you my story about George, um, I know what your brain is doing, confronted with this image, because you can't help yourself. You are drawn into it, and you have conducted stage one epidemiological analysis of this object. Assuming it's a bad thing to be undone, I had to take care that it wasn't a functional knot that was good. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, have gravitated to stage two epidemiological analysis, which is beginning to figure out the weaknesses of the thing itself. If I asked you to untie it, what are its vulnerabilities? Which strand would give way first? And then what would be your plan? And perhaps a little experimentation along the way, but if you'd really understood the structure then the vulnerability of the risk enterprise itself, if I, that's the analogy, uh, leads you to a tailor-made solution to undo the thing. This is a simple physical analogy for problem solving. Um, I, that's, I wanted a knot that would trigger that. What, um, people say, well, what's, what is it about this knot, apart from the fact that it's pretty, um, that triggers all of those cognitive processes? I think it's about the right level of complexity. There's a scale of complexity, and at one end is something simple and familiar that you've seen a thousand times, like a reef nut, and you were taught as a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout how to untie those in a hurry. And if I showed you that, you'd think about something different. And the opposite end of the spectrum of complexity is a ball of wool after a cat's been playing with it for half an hour, and it's a hopeless, tangled mess, and you'd be disinterested in that too. You'd want to throw it away. This is about the right level of complexity to grab your attention. It's six or seven things. You can pretty much memorize or master the structure um, in a minute or two. If you weren't entirely clear about that structure, you'd just look at the backside and then confirm. That's called gaining multiple perspectives on a problem until you really understand the way it is or the way it works. Um, and uh, those, you're using ordinary cognitive skills with which, by the way, you weren't born with. Um, I'm told by psychologists you learn them uh, between the ages of four and seven, or thereabouts. So that's the image that I wanted. Um, it's very simple to talk about in terms of personal cognitive skills. Um, oh, this is uh, New Hampshire. This is the license plate. I'm, I, I love it when I go there and I see this motto all the time, live free or die, um, because I hang out with regulators all the time. And I see, when I start seeing these number plates, I'm thinking to myself, isn't there something in between? <laughs> Where a little modicum of restraint would actually make life more civilized and maybe even longer and happier for people. But no, they are a live free or die state. Um, now, move from the individual cognition to the uh, organizational behavior, things get more complicated. This is the chart that I've been using. I first drew this in 1998, just to illustrate 
um, why problem-oriented approaches are different from program-centered approaches. It's a looks complicated, it's not really. There's a big general class of things out there in the world that we worry about. And that could be international trafficking in nuclear materials or women and children or drugs, or it could be um, violent crime or political corruption or environmental pollution. And when we get sufficiently perturbed by it, we invent a new government agency and an idea emerges. This is how we will deal with it in general, and we build big machines. Um, the machines are programmatic, they tend to be either functional or process-based, those are two quite different ideas in organizational theory. We know about specialist functions from the Industrial Revolution, so that we can have enclaves of high-quality performers, state-of-their-art. Then in the last 35 years, we learned process management also, so that when you set up a 911 system, or a tax returns processing system, or an environmental response to oil spills, or a consumer complaints response system, this is core, high volume, repetitive, transactional. It's worth organizing, it's worth engineering, and automating, and thinking about triage and protocols um, to make it all flow smoothly. That's what's in the top right hand corner but the world is big and we have regional offices and you have to divide up the work and hand it out. And you end up with a form in major uh, regulatory bureaucracies, which consists of functional units and process operations disaggregated to the regional level. And that's all good. And that's the way we've been organized for many years. And uh, we know the general theories that have come and gone in policing. Um, rapid response to calls for service coupled with detectives uh, investigating reported crime. That was the professional era in environmental protection. If you think most pollution comes from industrial plants, then the general theory is issue permits for discharges through your chimneys, uh, smokestacks, water pipe discharge, transportation of hazardous waste, control problems by attaching conditions to the permits, and then monitor compliance with the conditions on the permits, general theory of operations, which works fine for many things. Until, of course, along come environmental problems that have nothing to do with your local industrial facilities, such as radon in the homes, or sick office buildings, or airborne deposition of mercury from Mexico, um, or, or uh, Ill illegal but deliberate importation of exotic species, um, these things don't fit that model, and so it sort of wakes you up that your big engines are covering many things, but not all things. And then eventually this alternate method emerges, where you look more carefully at the general class and say, this isn't one type of political corruption, there's at least 57 varieties. So the disaggregation, the passing of the risk, the focusing on specific problems, and then if you do that and you do it with a will, what you end up with invariably is tailor-made interventions to specific issues. Um, and I drew this chart, uh, actually unusually I took some research funding for the book The Regulatory Craft, and the funding came in the form of the Innovations Program grant to the Kennedy School. So what I was doing was uh, categorizing innovations in regulatory, law enforcement, risk control, security, and intelligence, that half of government, not customer service provision. Um, but the whole risk or harm reduction side of government, what was happening? And it was very clear from 13 years of data um, that one of the things being celebrated was the ability of organizations to make tailor-made interventions to carefully identified problems. Um, there was an even bigger category of innovations winners at that time, 1998, 1999, and the preceding decade that belonged here. What is happening here? These are often analytic systems, data mining systems, anomaly detection systems, sometimes human and intelligence systems, learning from abroad, imagining problems that you've never seen, um, and uh, the ability to spot emerging problems quickly. Uh, general vocabulary, I call this the general class of vigilance mechanisms that enable you to see things that you never saw before and that you might not have known about if you hadn't deliberately looked for them. Um, so, 
I have to be careful um, because some people say, oh, you know, Sparrow says we're now doing risk-based regulation, so we don't care anymore about functional expertise and we don't have to worry anymore about process management. No, I never say such a thing. All I say is that these two methods, program-centric and problem-centric, are different. And this one is extremely well established and very formally managed. And this one in most professions, including the police profession, is relatively new, the last arrival, and in many cases, very immature, often not formally managed at all. One of the things that we could see very clearly in 1998-99 was the influence of Herman Goldstein, police departments were more than overrepresented in the winners and finalists in the Ford Foundation program. Because he had given police a 20-year start in discovery of what it meant to be problem-oriented. But that's not the only profession where this was happening, and some of the other more scientific professions um, have now caught up at least, if not overtaken, the police profession. Um, and uh, you know, just to clarify, um, your language to illustrate the types of tasks you might take on in the top set, uh, right from the bottom left. In the top right, you've got um, clear focus on what is your program. Um, I picked these from across a whole bunch of different arenas, so they're not all about policing. Um, and uh, you might imagine these as sort of breakout sessions at a conference, the one sentence description that helps you pick your breakout session. What am I gonna hear if I go there? Probably you're gonna hear a champion of negotiated rulemaking who's used it effectively in one area of environmental protection, and they're gonna be offering it to you so that you can use it too, or some variant of it, in a much broader range of environmental issues. So notice that all of these statements, different settings, are very specific about the programs um, being offered or expanded and very loosey-goosey and vague about the definition of the problem. That's characteristic of the way work is organized in the top right-hand corner. Switch to the bottom left-hand corner, problem-centric work. I've disciplined myself to use roughly the same number of words and all of the same domains, but these are very different task statements. Um, read a few of them. These are actually summary draft problem statements from different fields. I get into trouble in Washington if I mention this one, arsenic in, on golf courses, because they're all golf players. It's the federal sport of choice, I guess because they all eventually hope to play golf with the president, because um, all the presidents play golf. <clears throat> But they say, what, we're exposed to toxins on the surface? What is this one actually came from Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which was one of my beta sites for the development of environmental problem-solving techniques. And the fuller version says, arsenic concentrates in surface waters on golf courses in Florida caused by the overuse of a particular class of pesticides and fertilizers on putting grains, coupled with inadequate rainfall or irrigation in certain months of the year and it becomes apparent through a very sensitive uh, bioindicator, which is the appearance of mutated frogs uh, with the wrong number of legs or eyes. Um, that's the fuller version. Now I've told you this problem definition, which is what, four lines? Um, is it more or less complicated than the knot that I showed you? I think it's actually simpler than the knot. The knot had about six things going on. This one only has like three. I think that knot is about the level of complexity of very uh, many major regulatory issues. Um, that one's pretty simple to solve once you've seen it. Go find the relevant golf courses, give them advice about alternate uh, pesticides and fertilizers, train the local high school kids to do census of mutated frogs, which they did. They use high school kids all over Florida to count alligators on the way to school, all kinds of things. I recognize more than 11 different frog songs and, and uh, report changes in frequencies and so on. Um, question, where does program evaluation belong more naturally? Here with the problem-centric work or here with the program-centric work? Um, 
And it's a strange question because, you know, these are crude distinctions and life is probably more complicated, of course. Um, but it's obvious in this case what is the program that's being evaluated. And if it's there and it's big and it's permanent and it's expensive, it would be professionally irresponsible not to have it evaluated. So there's a very, very natural fit in the top right-hand corner. Um, and then the, the discussion that I've had in some of my papers and with the more stringent advocates of uh, evidence-based policing is the question, how well does it fit in the bottom left-hand corner? So you go to problem-centric work, and yes, it's not irrelevant, uh, but it's not so obviously relevant. Um, and actually, there's an awful lot of other sciences involved when you get down into the bottom left-hand corner. Now, one of the odd things um, that I've noticed in working across so many different disciplines is that uh, some regulators are inherently scientific. I'm talking natural sciences. So environmental protection, health protection to a degree, civil aviation, uh, nuclear power plant engineering, they are absolutely uh, riven through with PhDs in engineering, physics, chemistry, biology, um, or some other science. And in those areas, they don't talk about evidence-based policy. It just doesn't come up. They scarcely ever do randomized controlled trials. Uh, I'm pleased to observe that they don't use randomized controlled trials in airline safety. <laughs> they do an awful lot of experimentation in labs, and, uh, they, and they test components uh, rigorously, and they test training in simulators. Um, but it's not of the type it's more natural science investigation techniques than social science uh, because they are intensely focused on the connecting mechanism. They study how the thing works. If it's a watch and it's broken and you open it up and the spring is broken and you replace it and you close the watch and it works again, you know you fixed it because you've got a very clear view inside the mechanism. And you don't need 50 um, in a control sample to say, I fixed it. Um, so they, they vary uh, across different fields in the degree to which they're getting inside mechanisms and therefore relying on natural sciences, as opposed to observing from a distance effects over time using very sophisticated statistical techniques to determine whether this caused that. They're just different, and it's a fascinating uh, thing to observe. Um, I think there's tension in the bottom left-hand corner uh, to a degree. Um, I'm not the only one to lay out some of these things. Um, several other scholars have at least asked these questions. Um, and when I uh, lay these out for police practitioners, um, which I've done over the years, many of them say, oh, you mean I can actually do problem solving without having to run randomized controlled trials? I say, yes. And they say, wow, that's a huge relief. They didn't realize that. Um, they'd been led to believe that if you couldn't do a randomized control, you ought not to be experimenting, and you certainly shouldn't be using a method that hasn't been demonstrated to work. Here's some of the basic reasons, and several people have observed them. To establish what works takes three to five years. A lot of problem-solving work is going on a shorter time frame than that. Um, if you are sort of disciplined police by saying you must only use what works, they might hear that as meaning you can't try anything new, which would be tragic in this context. Um, the focus tends to be on subtle effects at higher levels. Does this big, broad program affect overall crime rates reported in an area? It's quite different from did we solve the problem of high school kids committing burglaries on the way home in the late afternoon? Um, Problem solving tends to focus on more obvious effects for smaller objects or at lower levels. Uh, if you push practitioners to um, very high quality experimental protocols, they might end up, unfortunately, more reluctant to do cruder experiments. And you might have to end up encouraging them to soften their, those requirements. Um, and of course, program evaluation perpetuates a program-centric mindset about what works. Um, now, and so I could go on, but I won't because this is all written. You can find it in a variety of places. And it's a, it's a healthy, I think, and continuing debate on the question of well, what kinds of 
uh, analytic support really are required to support the problem-solving uh, initiative. Um, before I leave this, I, I, I often ask my classes, who are mixed regulators, usually 65 in a class and more than 30 different regulatory professions represented in the room, and if they're not convinced that you ought to develop a problem-oriented capability, I pose them a particular question. I say, um, let's imagine that all of your programs are perfect. Um, your functional units, your detectives, your microbiologists, your auditors, um, they're all state of their art and as good as they could be, competent, professional, and efficient. And your processes are sweetly oiled engines rumbling along, um, what do you say here, lickety, tickety boo, lickety split? I don't know what the Swedish would be, but there's nothing wrong with them. It would probably be a lovely word. Um, so all of that's working perfectly. While your functions and processes, all your programs are working perfectly, what are the, ty the types of risk that nevertheless might not be well controlled? Are. I let them finish the sentence. All your programs, all your routine operations are perfect in every way that we know how to measure them. Nevertheless, the types of risks that might not be well controlled are those that, it doesn't take them long to come up with a list. Here are the ones that they usually come up with. Catastrophic risk, things that don't normally happen, therefore aren't represented in the normal workload. Uh, emerging risks that weren't there when you built your uh, original system, often to do with technical innovation in several different industries. Uh, they are not covered by established programs because the programs were established before they appeared. Um, invisible risks, very well known in the criminological literature, consensual crimes, things with very low discovery rates uh, or reporting rates, um, so you actually don't know how much of it there is. The problem itself might be totally invisible or only a partial or biased uh, view of it in your normal data. Uh, risks involving conscious adversaries or um, adaptive opponents, uh, people who respond to your control interventions and they're clever. So terrorists, thieves, hackers, uh, any kind of cyber criminal. Um, they're thinking several moves ahead. This is now your analytic operation is converted into an intelligence operation. And the one who wins this game is the one who gets inside the head of the opponent, works out what they're going to do next or what they should do next. Um, boundary spanning risks. It's not if, it, if the risk, like juvenile delinquency, sits across four major public functions. Um, it's not conceivable that the program owned by any one of them could be the solution. You need a different approach. And of course, persistent risks, the most obvious reason, we keep on getting cases. We can see them all. We handle each one perfectly. Um, but because the numbers keep coming, we're obviously not controlling the underlying problem, and it's time to think differently, move it from the top right into the bottom left, and address it in that way. And I'm sure there could be 30 such lists of risks uh, but these are the ones most commonly put forward, most obvious to people. Um, even if everything else is working perfectly, you would need the problem-oriented capability if you had any of these as part of your workload. Now, look carefully at these and say, well, what's the analytic requirement? These all present major, major analytic and scholarly um, support. Usually not program evaluation, at least certainly not up front. Um, and they're all rather peculiar and different in the kinds of um, analysis that they would need. So for catastrophic risk, um, there's a lot of work to be done in uh, imagining things that haven't happened ever but could. There's the collation of experience from abroad, borrow everybody else's misery anywhere on Earth, bring it here and use it as a learning device to test our readiness, to assess the probability, to figure out whether we should worry at all or not, and if so, how. Um, that's an awful lot of uh, uh, data gathering from far afield, uh, deliberate exploitation of near misses when four of the factors were present, but the fifth one was not, so nothing bad happened, but it could have done. And we wipe our brow and say, thank heavens, 
But no, 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 these are major, major opportunities for cross-agency learning enterprises, but that has to be organized, it has to be set up, uh, there's a scholarly role. Emerging risks, you would care a lot about your capacity for uh, anomaly detection at the early stages. So all many different types of uh, pattern recognition um, to notice departures from normal loads of any type and then to inquire into them, find out what's going on here. Um, deliberate hunting for emerging risks based on the experience of other jurisdictions. So first gathering that knowledge, then apply, uh, figuring out the algorithms, then applying them and investigating what they show. An enormous amount of analytic support. Invisible risks, uh, these are plagued by what I call uh, the macro level uh, circularity trap of underinvestment. You don't know how bad it is, how much domestic violence there really is, how much exploitation within a mental ward or a boarding house or a nursing home, because most of the news does not leak out. Um, well, because you don't know how bad it is, you can't um, build the case for much budget. Because you can't spend much, you can't spend much on discovery. So you don't discover much. You've reinforced the notion that it might not be so bad. That's the circularity trap. I've already gone around it once. Um, there's a scholarly job to be done in breaking open that circularity trap by measuring the scale of the issue. And that can only be done, well, it's normally done by a rigorous audit of a random or representative sample that you can then extrapolate to the whole population. Um, um, all of your visible metrics, of course, are ambiguous because they are the product of the prevalence times the discovery rate. And so when that number moves up or down, you never know whether that's good news or bad news. It's a scholarly job to decouple those two, either by measuring the prevalence, or if you can't do that in certain settings, by measuring your discovery rate. Um, sometimes by testing discovery mechanisms deliberately, sometimes by artful and creative cross-matching from other data sources. Um, risks involving conscious opponents, there's an intelligence game being played here. Um, huge value in figuring out what they're thinking, um, using either um, surveillance techniques, development of informants, uh, trades with convicted felons so that they'll give you information about what the industry is planning in exchange for a year off their sentence. Um, and if you can't figure out what they're actually thinking, then work out what they should be thinking. Pay honest people good money for dishonest thinking. But somebody has to convene the meeting. Call the people who can imagine what should be in their heads or work out, spend time working out what's in their heads. It's a very specific type of work that you only have to do with this class of risks. And boundary spanning risks, think of the examples, uh, if you heard the presentations in this hall, where issues were not specific to the police, and the scholars played uh, an impressive and vital role in holding together a coalition and binding them to an analytic rigor uh, which they probably couldn't have done without somebody with some academic credibility being there to say, this is how we proceed. These are the steps of the problem-solving process. We haven't dealt yet with problem definition. We're not yet ready to think about metrics. Um, persistent risks, that's of course um, cluster analysis usually um, from visible data. Um, and uh, we've heard many, many uh, very fascinating cases of that work being done. Um, over the course of this conference. So I'm not opposed to an analysis. In fact, I'm always stressing the importance of analysis in the problem-solving arena. The rule of thumb that I have dealing with regulatory agencies is for any project you launch, probably 20% of your effort will be analytical, at least 20%. And of course, it should scale with the size and complexity of the problem. Uh, but roughly 20% or a bit more is a useful rule of thumb. And that's usually more than they have available to support problem solving at different levels of the organization. So all I'm doing is pointing out there's a much, much broader range and a very special range of analytic supports that this method requires. Um, and I'm hoping that we can broaden the offerings from the field of scholarship 
um, to be careful and to pin it to these different stages, to these different categories of risk um, along the way. Oh, I was working with OSHA years ago. Um, it's Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, it was late 1990s. And an inspector came to me one day and said, uh, uh, you know, your book, The Regulatory Craft, it's, um, it was just coming out. Um, it says it's a bit long, 365 pages. And this man said to me, Professor, um, we don't read books. And I believed him. Um, and he said, you must give me a short version. What is this thing? Um, and I said, well, how short does it need to be? Uh, are you thinking a chapter? Could I pick a chapter and send you that? Oh, no, nothing like that long, he said. Uh, are you thinking a page? Are you thinking a diagram? He said, I'm thinking a sentence, and please keep it short. <laughs> I was curious. I said, I, you know, forgive me for asking, but why do you want this whole idea, um, you know, fundamental, complicated as it is, boiled down into one short sentence? He gave me a very fascinating answer, which I respect. He said, I want to be able to tell my family what we're doing that's different. Um, so I gave him, I made up a short sentence, this is it. <laughs> Which makes everyone laugh, in fact it makes them insult you, you're from Harvard and this is what you come up with, you know. <laughs> give me a break, go back to your uh, ivory tower, of course we do this, everything that we do, all our programs are about this. And I let them vent, and then I say, well hold on a minute. I'm sure that's right, I don't mean to insult you in any way, I'm sure you're doing a huge amount of things, and by the way, I'm absolutely sure that you have already solved a whole bunch of important problems. I can see that in your history. But if you're using this as a method, operationally, let me just check, I want to ask you a couple questions. My first question is, who picks? What's their name? If you can't tell me who picks, you're not doing it. Uh, maybe it's not a person, maybe it's a committee. Well, where, what's that committee called and how often does it meet? And when did they last pick? And where's the list come from that they pick from? And if you're going to pick from a list, then you've got to have an idea about the set of criteria that you will use in assessing comparative importance. And you need to know what you will say to the people who suggested problems that you didn't pick. These are simple mechanical questions require simple mechanical answers, and if you can't tell me how that works, I don't believe you're doing it. And what this does is just points very quickly and easily to the necessary machinery um, in the background, which is a backdrop to figuring out the necessary academic support. Uh, this one actually got lengthened in the end when OSHA was up for abolition. This was Newt Gingrich and the freshman Republican Congress. Um, they, they swept into power both houses in the 1994 election and uh, they targeted three agencies. Uh, OSHA was top of the list, slated for abolition. Uh, EPA and its enforcement budget was next and the um, FDA was third in line uh, under lobbying pressure from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and uh, they drafted the bill to abolish OSHA. The Republicans had a, um, um, a little phrase. They said, uh, we want to replace OSHA with a brochure. <laughs> In other words, just give inf information to industry. They have motivated correctly. They'll do the right thing. Well, no, they won't. That's not quite their motivation. Their motivation is to maximize return for shareholders. It's not always in line with the occupational mission, unless you make it so. Um, but uh, they never got to vote, vote on the Ballinger bill, and one of the uh, main reasons was the Washington Post came to OSHA's defense. It was a very bizarre and unusual thing. Some journalist, whose name I can't remember, I've got the story in my file somewhere, wrote a story and said, before we abolish OSHA, we should just remember what they've accomplished. And then there were 11 paragraphs. 11 problems solved. This is how many people used to die of um, brown lung disease in the uh, mining industry. This is how many people used to, and then OSHA got involved and it went down to this. This is how many people used to die from asbestosis in the tiling industry, and it now has gone down to this. This is how many farm workers used to drown in grain silos 
um, before OSHA paid attention to that problem. It went down from this to this. This is how many airborne sawdust explosions we used to have in, uh, in uh, lumber mills, um, and it's gone from this to this. 11 of those, and it saved OSHA. So not only learn to do it and all of its complexity, but learn how to build it into your reporting story um, to present a, a, a tale that makes sense and is convincing. They could probably do with some academic help writing that story too. Uh, I showed up once in Holland. Um, this was the uh, Authority for Financial Markets in Amsterdam, and these were the coffee cakes that they presented. Uh, pick your important problems, fix them, tell people about it. And you've noticed that the English isn't quite the same, and the reason is they'd, they'd heard what it was from Osho, they translated it into Dutch, they translated it back into English for me, and put it on these coffee cakes. Um, to get the writing this fine, they had to use a particular kind of icing, which tasted disgusting. <laughs> um, you've got the Sierra model. Um, I've had to adjust it a little bit with experience in other areas. Um, I think we had to, there's two things that we need um, to provide adequate machinery. One is the protocol through which any problem-solving project goes. And the other is the background managerial infrastructure that runs the whole system. And my impression, uh, one of the things that's odd about the police implementations is we've talked a lot about the protocols for projects. And we've talked a little bit less, quite a lot less, in fact, about the background managerial infrastructure. Um, so I'm not going to spend long on this. The only reason that this is different from Sarah is that uh, I've deliberately separated stage one nomination from everything that follows because it's not right to assume that the person who nominates the problem is on the team. A lot of people make that mistake up front. Anyone who steps forward and says, I see a problem, they are the team leader. Well, it's your best and brightest people that will be offering things up. And if they discover that every time they do that, it's more work for them, they will stop doing it. So it works for a very short period with a few bright sparks. But then it's got to go back up through the HR system and a real uh, organized method of collating nominations, handing them out, asking people, uh, but balancing their workload at the same time. Um, I emphasize the need to be able to close projects. Uh, because often projects are launched in the public sector and then they just peter out or they stall and then we forget them. That's not any kind of a discipline. Projects should be closed either because they're hopeless and they failed and you'd better spend your resources on something more promising or because they've succeeded enough so that this risk at this level is now no longer the priority for special attention or because a crisis emerges and so the project must be shelved because it's all hands on deck to deal with the crisis and then you need an orderly process for restoring it, bringing it back to its position. Um, and I do stress the long-term monitoring and maintenance. We've seen several stories this week, uh, this, uh, this conference, where there was initial success and then a period of new low levels, but then it creeps up and we're not sure why and sometimes don't even have the data or analysis to say what happened that's different. Um, an ordinary part of the discipline in many other professions is that you must, when you present a plan, explain how once the initial investment period is over, you'll be able to withdraw resources from this problem without it reappearing. Um, that means you're going to prefer systematic or technical solutions that don't require continuous monitoring and compliance. And if you are going to require monitoring of people's behavior, you might have some third party or different mechanism for doing that, or at least a cheap way of doing it on a sampling basis. Um, but uh, built into the plan is a way of making sure it cannot re-emerge, at least without trips and alarms and triggers uh, that will get us back on the job. Um, a strange but essential twist in the tail to the problem-solving protocol. Uh, that was the sort of minimal skeletal version implemented in three of my first big clients. Um, and here it appears you know, precisely those steps. Where is this one? Um, occupational safety in Victoria, Australia. And notice they're beginning to put detail underneath each of these stages. And another one that's actually bit more interesting, Transport Safety Victoria in Australia, and this is the Rail Safety Division, implemented this method. They used precisely those six stages, 
And the reason that there's more detail under here, just notice um, they're beginning to specify the role for executives and for at each stage. And they're also beginning to have an expectation about schedules at each stage and who will determine it and how will it be monitored and who's in charge of supervision. Um, and actually what they're doing there is they're beginning to make the connections between the project-specific protocol and the background managerial infrastructure. What is the background managerial infrastructure? I think at the minimum it's all of these things. You need a nomination system, a way of channeling them and funneling them to a central point so that they can be assessed and compared. You need a selection system that develops a set of criteria that should be used, and probably a few that must not be used so as to avoid nepotism or political corruption or interference from the industry. Um, then if you're going to, once you've picked them, the HR system has to know how to assign people and time and money and analytic support. Um, and then it's got to go through the recording system. You've got to have a sensible periodic reviewing system, channeling it into the performance reports of the agency. And of course, you're asking people to do work that's not familiar to them and is very scary. So they need supports. Um, police agencies often don't have those formal mechanisms. Um, you might run a few good projects with a few champions successfully without them. Uh, but you won't build it into your operation on a sustainable basis unless you have every one of these. Well, which of these are special opportunities for scholarly intervention? I would say number one, number two, and number seven. Um, finding things in the first place. Anomaly detection, scanning of many different types, intelligence from abroad and searching to see whether you have it here. Uh, the comparis comparison of, you've got 15 different problem nominations, we've got imperfect information about their scale or scope or concentration. A lot of work to be done in helping managers be able to make a sensible informed decision about which ones are more important. And it's often academics or consultants that can play this special role sitting next to managers supervising projects or even working with team leaders uh, giving them confidence that they can actually make these decisions um, and uh, that we know how to deal with failure and problems, uh, projects that don't work. If those were all necessary, these two are luxuries, would be nice, and here the police profession excels way better than many other professions. Um, you have a reward system, thank heavens, for the Herman Goldstein Award Program. Many organizations have no way of acknowledging expert work in the problem-solving arena. And the police profession has worked diligently through this conference and through many others and through the um, Problem-Oriented Policing Center to build uh, knowledge so that you don't, somebody facing a problem of a particular type at least has contact information and reference materials. They don't have to think of everything for new for themselves. All terribly valuable. Many, many different types of uh, scholarly intervention and support. Um, to adjust to this, uh, to provide a, a more rounded support, um, what, what direction might we expect scholarship? Uh, what fronts should they be moving on? I just, I'll, you'll have all the slides, so I'm not gonna dwell on these. I think we need to have a broader range of crime analysis and pattern recognition systems. We certainly, need to move beyond the prominent focus on place and time um, because the multi-dimensional nature of risk in every setting demands it. Uh, we've got to be able to spot emerging novel and unfamiliar problems um, that we've never seen before. Uh, I think we have to learn um, to have investigative field craft work more closely with data analysis rather than them being two very separate ideas so that you can develop from the data an idea about what might be happening, go test it on the street and undercover shopping, a little bit of surveillance, come back, adjust your hypotheses, uh, filter your data in a different way, go back and forth between these two. Investigation of complex problems seems to require uh, that uh, collaborative um, type of investigation. Uh, I think we should look carefully at each stage of the problem-solving process, and it's not on this list, but we should look also at the wicked categories of risk um, and understand their specific um, analytical uh, support requirements. We should design and deliver um, quality analytic support throughout 
every level of the police organization because problems are small, medium, or large, and projects should be able to be organized at all of those levels. So there's no one right level for the analytic support. Uh, they should go to the scale of the issue. Uh, scholars have the time and the luxury to study intractable problems where practitioners might not, um, and we've got to help develop the crime analysis and intelligence field without letting it be captured um, uh, by a rather solitary focus on program evaluation. It must be kept much broader than that, in my view. Um, and also, I think we need, uh, thinking about vigilant systems, we, know, we need to know how to watch, how to avoid failures of imagination, how much to spend looking for things that might not be there at all. This is a very complicated analytical question about the nature of vigilance. Uh, it doesn't really lend itself to strict mathematical solutions. Um, it's uh, rather political, somewhat subjective, but needs to be more analytical than it is at the moment. Uh, these are just some of the areas in which I'm hoping, hoping for a broadening of the contributions of academia. My last slide, I think, if I shuffled them correctly. I appreciate philanthropy. Um, I appreciate Jerry Lee and the contribution that he has made. Uh, here, I appreciate um, the Commonwealth Fund of New York that first took me to America with a Harkness uh, Fellowship uh, and how I met the Kennedy School. I appreciate the Mott Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, uh, the Ford Foundation that at various times have supported my work and Kennedy School work on many of these issues. Um, just occasionally I've been invited to go talk to not-for-profit groups uh, in some of these areas where actually not-for-profit groups do a lot of the work. They don't quite fit government agencies. So a lot of poverty reduction work, um, child mortality work, control of AIDS in Africa work. A lot of these are not so much government operations as the work of major foundations. Um, and uh, just thinking about the shape of foundations, this is a very simple idea. Some foundations... Um, are really tightly focused on one particular problem. They have a problem-centric focus. But they're prepared to, like this one here, they're prepared to consider a rather broad range of ideologies or beliefs or methods. Uh, but they're more particular about the problem than they are about the uh, solution that they prefer. Other uh, because in the not-for-profit sector, um, the ideology of the organization very much follows the ideology of the donors, some of them are quite a different shape. And some say, well, I've got a particular method or approach that I believe in. It could be applied across a rather different range of problems, but my business is the delivery of um, mosquito netting. Or my business is the delivery of uh, public drinking water wells or my business is the organization of needle exchange programs um, in developing countries. That's what we do, that's what we're good at. Now notice these are very different shapes, just on those simple two dimensions. Well, interesting puzzle. Um, what kind of constellations or cooperations might then appear in a not-for-profit arena? How would uh, not-for-profits, different foundations, naturally group themselves together? And there's two very obvious but extreme possibilities. One is uh, you could group yourselves together because you share the same beliefs. You get along well. Your donors might be brothers or related, come from the same background. Um, and what that's doing is um, uh, the 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 foundations are related in some way or another, they espouse similar approaches, and curiously, they ought not to be collaborating because they should be in competition for resources and for credit and for market share, but they do because they're allowed to in the not-for-profit arena, and if they did this in the corporate sector, it would be called a cartel, and it would be illegal. But it works fine in the not-for-profit arena. Now, the other kind of constellation that we can imagine is uh, vertical. We have a focus on a very specific problem and we've got all kinds of different ideas that could be useful. And uh, there's a better chance if we could get all of those 
uh, ideologies in the room together, um, there's a very much better chance that we would be able to fashion a combined protocol involving multiple um, interventions and stages um, from the miscellaneous contributions of several. Um, my last observation, which I, I, I only included this slide at um, 3 a.m. this morning, thinking about the four um, groups that had supported all of the work here in the Stockholm Criminal, Criminology Symposium. Um, who will organize this? Who will bring together um, the contributors from philanthrop philanthropy in the most effective manner to address gaps in our uh, solution set for the world's major problems. The only people I can think of that can do that are scholars. Um, I, I observe the convening power of universities. People will go to conferences on issues at Harvard or in Cambridge or UCL or Liverpool or here. Um, the scholars have a very special opportunity in this field. Uh, so I guess there's three parts. If you need an acronym, I just worked it out. It would be MOO, M -O -O. Um, You would, first of all, do mapping to begin to understand the complex texture and structure uh, uh, within a class of harms. How is it concentrated? What scale and scope to choose? Which are the pieces neglected by public agencies? Um, where is, where and how is the issue concentrated? After mapping comes overlay. When you look at the potential organizations that could contribute or want to contribute, what is it that they can offer or could offer or want to offer and overlay that on the map um, and see how they line up. And then after mapping and overlaying orchestration to sign up to build commitments, um, to have them work together even though they have quite different ideologies. This, I believe, is a very strange and special opportunity for scholarship to give back to the world of philanthropy. Philanthropy does so much for scholarship. Here is a peculiar opportunity and a terribly important one in this domain for scholarship to give back to uh, philanthropy. Um, I hope that in some way, you know, my peculiar perspective on these things um, has been useful to you. I hope that for at least some of you, it might mean that you are prepared to consider a much broader range of scholarly contributions in support of crime control. And I do hope that you will find it exciting that the methodolo methodologies that you use already, and if you perfect this interaction between scholars and practitioners, all of those skills and methods have a vast field to which they can be applied uh, way beyond the field of policing. Um, that's certainly enough to keep me busy for the rest of my working life. And again, thank you for welcoming me here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I take full responsibility for all of the wonderful things we've heard in the last 14 minutes, because I told Malcolm to go over. We don't have anything on the program until 1 o'clock. But at 1 o'clock, we're taking attendance, so we can monitor your compliance with the program this afternoon. And um, then we might do a randomized trial, but we'll have to debate that. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.